there are advantages and disadvantages to having a job share. The disadvantage of having a job share, especially with Heather, is that she's likely to accept an invitation to come and speak on a podium in front of 700 people, <laughs> believing we have something to say and to share that might be of interest to our peers. I suppose, actually, the advantage of that is that it has really helped us question what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what we have that might be of interest to share with you. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to um, spend some time sharing some of that, our thoughts, uh, some of the challenges, and um, a lot of that will be very familiar to you. Um, we're not here as experts. We're here as your peers and your colleagues, and we hope that we can have some conversations over the next few days about what we're each doing to face the challenges that, uh, that, are, that are around for all of us. This 50th uh, photograph is, um, of course, a, a group of staff and volunteers at St. Christopher's, taken a couple of years ago as we celebrated that 50th anniversary, and many of you also celebrated as the 50th anniversary of the modern hospice movement. We knew that that was um, going to be a, a milestone for us when we joined St. Christopher's. We've been there now some four years, and um, it was always sort of looming. And, um, in that year, we spent a lot of time reflecting and reflecting on the past and honouring the past and thinking about our, our roots and what we wanted to hang on to. But of course, we have to think about the future and we have the responsibility to make sure that our organisation is facing a future in very uncertain times. The uncertainty of which gaps to fill, um, which NHS contracts to sign, um, how to recruit to some of the gaps in our, in our, in our professional workforce. Um, and we have had a whole host of internal uh, conversations about how we best do that. So those conversations, um, again, one of the benefits of being in the job share is that occasionally we get some time over overlapping when we're not both in meetings. And um, those of you that know me will know my penchant for something, for, for wanting to provoke. So sometimes on a Tuesday morning, I will be sitting in the, in the office, op desk opposite Heather, and, um, and I'll come up with something like, is hospice dead? Uh, because we have to think the unthinkable if we are to make plans about the future and to really unpick the resources that we have at our fingertips and, and be prepared for that uncertain future. And the conversation will suddenly unravel something like this. And of course, this is where we get to the point that uh, Tracy started, which is about evolution or, or revolution. And we've rather um, focused on the term reinvention. And I suppose our, our, our take on that is that evolution, in our view, especially in our experience at St. Christopher's, takes such a long time. And the powers and the forces of change that are around us at the moment, the multifaceted nature of that, and indeed the urgency of some of those things that we must respond to, uh, requires us to perhaps be more towards the revolution than towards the evolution. But hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll all find our ways um, to position ourselves in that challenge. And as we were preparing for today, we decided that we would turn to our colleagues and we have asked about over 30 people in and outside the sector what their response to the provocation about reinvention was. And their thoughts and inputs have shaped what we're sharing with you this morning. Okay. So we have three propositions. And, um, they're propositions that are, that are critical, really, um, from our perspective. We actually believe that reinvention is a necessity. It isn't an option, as far as we're concerned. Um, and that our desired state in a generation's time has to, be, has to be different. We have a number of drivers, which we'll outline for you this morning. Um, and it's our belief that we have radical change to face if we are to survive that. Now, we'll each do that in different ways. Our localities, our supporters, our, our particular NHS conditions, the size of our hospices and whether we're engaged in primarily community or inpatient care or, or, or 
or how we get our funding will all make differences to, to how we respond. Um, but this morning we want to share some of the drivers as we see them and also how we're responding to those at St Christopher's. Thank you, Sean, and good morning to all of you. So I'm going to spend just a few moments now uh, thinking about the drivers that must shape the reinvention, the drivers that we think uh, are essential for us to respond to. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what our desired future state would look like if our reinvention was successful. We've been working uh, uh, as, as joint chief executives with uh, Caroline Copeman, uh, a, a consultant at Cass Business School. And she's always at pains to say to us when we talk about uh, the programme of change that we're thinking about, uh, you must tell your staff what its destination point is. The only way that you're going to get people to go on a long and difficult uh, journey is if they know what the arrival point is. And as importantly, uh, when you talk about the arrival point, make sure that they understand the benefits that will exist there, uh, most importantly for the beneficiaries and also for them. Otherwise, they're never going to be prepared to engage in the pain that that journey uh, may give rise to. So let's start by thinking about the drivers that will shape our reinvention. Some of these are about demography and uh, changing uh, society. Some of them are about the NHS and social care systems in which we operate. Some, uh, for charitable hospices, are about uh, our role in the voluntary sector and the way that we uh, gain our funding in order to deliver services. And of course, there are uh, some new competitors coming into the market, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a while. Not all these drivers are challenges. Some of them are terrific opportunities. Uh, the increased public involvement, for example, the interest of the public to engage in end-of-life care has to be one of the best opportunities that we have moving forward. There was a survey done uh, by um, Dying Matters, I think it was last year, May 2017, which uh, confirmed just how many people in the public uh, were willing not only to be involved in the care, but who expected their neighbours and friends to, Im to be involved in any care that they might be delivering. They were happy to share responsibility for end of life with professionals. And uh, we at St Christopher's take, uh, take great confidence, feel confident uh, and, uh, and are pleased about that. Technological opportunities are also something that we must take advantage of. Uh, the hospice sector has been slow to get underway with this, uh, the NHS not much faster, but we're really confident that technology could help patients really engage with their clinicians, they, it could really help people self-manage, uh, technology could help people monitor their symptoms and, and uh, communicate them. Uh, and we could do so much more with that. Our business uh, is death, dying and loss. And so it would be uh, wrong not to start with the changing picture of dying. Tracy has already begun to uh, talk about this, but I want to take us back to the 1900s when uh, Sister Mary Aikenhead came from Dublin to London to set up St. Joseph's Hospice. At that time, her heart, her burden, was for people dying of infectious diseases like TB. When Cicely Saunders opened St Christopher's some 60 years later, her concern was no longer for people with infectious diseases. It was for people with cancer. And heart disease as a killer was on the rise uh, alongside cancer. Today, a new group of people emerges for whom we must have a burden those people who are frail, living into old age with multiple morbidities. And that picture is only likely to increase in the coming 10 or 15 years. When Mary Aikenhead uh, came to set up St. Joseph's, disability before death wasn't even a real issue. Uh, today, 
uh, the predominant problem that people in our frailty service have at St Christopher's is around uh, their physical dependence and their ongoing deterioration uh, in terms of their functionality. It isn't just that what people are dying for from is different, it's also about the scale, and Tracy mentioned this too. This is a uh, work that was done by Anna Bone and her colleagues, uh, reported last year, I think. And on the left-hand side, uh, they predict the number of deaths and the age of deaths in 2040 based on current trends. And you can see both increasing numbers and increasing age uh, in that picture. On the right-hand side, they predict where people will die. And this, I think, is probably uh, newer for many of you than perhaps the picture of growing need. They estimate that nearly 70% of people will either die in a care home or at home. Hospital will cease to be the place where the majority of people die. And in, for care homes, they predict that the number of people dying in that context will double. It'll move from 20% to 40 percent. At the moment, I think uh, hospices don't recognise all that we could do with care homes. Uh, we could do so much more, and this is one good reason why we need to give it even more attention. Hospices have always had uh, a slightly ambivalent uh, relationship, I think, with the NHS. We don't know if we're in or we're out. We don't know whether we want to be in or whether, we're at, whether we want to be uh, outside of it. But for our patients, we are often a, a part of a system that they see as one. And so it's important to think a little bit about how people's expectations of the NHS is changing too. In 1967, when Dame Cicely opened St Christopher's, the NHS was on the ascendant. It was a time of investment. It was a time when people uh, were able for the first time to access high quality health care, regardless of whether they had the opportunity to pay for it. It was a time of real pioneering medicine. I think uh, antibiotics were in use. Uh, I think the first organ uh, transplants happened in that time. And there was significant breakthrough and investment in research. 70 years on, people are less confident. Uh, there's a whole range uh, of reasons for that, but people uh, believe now that they must take some responsibility for their health care. Uh, they recognise the importance of some services and of public health in particular. And as they look forward, they're concerned increasingly about the fact that they may have to pay for some services. And indeed, we already see that happening. And there are some people who believe that by 2040, the NHS may not exist at all. I've spoken a little about the character of dying, but let's think about the experience of dying uh, as well. When Cicely Saunders opened St Christopher's and in her vision for hospice care uh, that we're all enacting, there was a huge emphasis on enabling people to live well as well as to die well. And that notion of living well continues to be part of our thinking at St Christopher's and I'm sure it's part of yours as well. What that comprises though is very different now. I, I think that so much of what people consider to be living well now focuses on choice, it focuses on control, on self-determination. There is a, an experience, I think, of loneliness now for people that are dying, both social and existential, that perhaps Cicely Saunders would not have seen to the extent or the duration that we see it now. If you read some of her early work, she talks a lot about reaching out to families, but she makes very little mention of people as carers. Carers is a much more recent notion, and some of the carers that we meet in our work, and you will know, are carers for extended periods of time. And for many, uh, the, the, um, uh, the role of carer and cared for moves between people. 
For some time you might be the carer and then you might need to be cared for and vice versa. Perhaps most importantly for today, there is a real issue about uncertainty. It's not just uncertainty that's medical in nature. It's about, uh, it's about people's social experiences, about the, co the cohesion, the capacity, and the capability of family and social networks. And as importantly, the people on the, on the margins, the people who often get forgotten, has changed as well. In Sicily's biography, which I'm going to speak about a little bit uh, later, she describes her first uh, thoughts about people dying of cancer. And if you read that, and then you think about frailty, almost everything that she describes for people with cancer in the 1960s is what you'd find uh, for people who have frailty now. Often poorly die, often uh, unidentified, poorly diagnosed, uh, uncoordinated care, uh, and so on. There are new entrants into a market in which we have had a niche role historically. Care homes, uh, I've spoken about briefly, but I was very struck by a comment that Jo Hockley made uh, at, uh, when I was uh, sitting with her at a conference recently when she remarked that care homes today are the hospices of yesteryear. Sean and I spent some time a few weeks ago with an experienced palliative care nurse, Rachel Hill. She's just moving to run a retirement village in Surrey. And when we asked her about that change, she commented that she felt that, re that retirement villages were the place where you might be able to age best and in which palliative care is integrated most naturally. Any of you who came to our innovation conference that we ran in partnership with Hospice UK last year will remember Martin Wilson, the geriatrician uh, from Glasgow, who spoke about geriatrics being palliative care uh, at scale. And there are a number of new services that are coming into being set in primary care, drawing together rehabilitation experts and care of the elderly physicians uh, who are attending to just that population that we may also want to care for in the future. People with long-term conditions, often multiple morbidities, who would otherwise fall through the net. All of that leads us to a position where we believe that our business model must change. Paul Palmer, who leads the charity for uh, the Centre for Charity Effectiveness, talks about our business model being almost exhausted. There is something about our historical roots in oncology, about our reliance on voluntary income, about our ambivalent relationship with the NHS uh, that, that means that this is tenuous at best. And so as part of our reinvention, we must rethink that model. Perhaps most importantly, as a driver, I want to make a suggestion that suffering around end of life care continues to be as much of a problem now as it was when Dame Sicily uh, conceived um, St. Christopher's. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to spend a couple of days with uh, hospital-based colleagues working in a palliative care team. They're experienced, and I was uh, deeply impressed by the work that they do. I'd worked in hospital palliative care some 30 years ago. I thought that things would be utterly different, and in many respects they were. I couldn't understand, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't have been able to find my way around the hospitals. I didn't understand the computer systems. I had never heard of some of the uh, teams that existed. But what I was struck by was how that picture of suffering in those three patients that I visited on my first morning was reminiscent of what I'd been working with 30 years ago. I don't have time to tell you today the stories of those three people. But what I am struck by was that their suffering was primarily because nobody had recognised for at least two of them that they were dying at a time when they could have been somewhere different. 
nobody had had the conversations with the family of the man on the left to enable them to work with him to, to uh, make sure that he was in the right place for him and his children. The, the, uh, the symptom control was poor because it was so um, uncoordinated. And the man on the right, he was crying not because of the pain that he was experiencing, but because he was desperate to get his next dose of analgesia in order to keep that pain at bay. And he had rung the bell nine times and was now an hour and a quarter late for that much needed uh, painkiller. When we wrote to Scott Murray, he talked about our success in the future being measured by the extent to which we managed to prevent and alleviate suffering for all in our catchment area. Cicely Saunders said that suffering is only intolerable when nobody cares. So we must continue to do that in the event that others forget or can't manage it. Let's move on then uh, briefly to think about what our desired future state would look like if we do reinvention well. I hadn't planned to include a slide that spoke about what we must retain. In the past, I've talked about uh, making sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but one of Sean's controversial conversations with me in our office is, are there any babies left to keep? Well, there are. <laughs> and the reason that I know that is that we had a fantastic response from uh, representatives of people in partnership, uh, the group of people that supports Hospice UK uh, as uh, people with personal experience about end of life. And they were absolutely convinced that some aspects of hospice care must be retained at whatever cost. I, will, I, I haven't time to tell you their, their detailed responses, but they spoke uh, repeatedly of care that's unique to each individual, care that is personalized, care that puts patients in charge of their own care and their treatment, care that enables people to drive what they have when they can do that. They spoke about care that is consistent and informed based on the story of what's important to them. And they spoke of relational care at its heart. One of them spoke of the experience of her partner who had died recently, and she spoke about the personal nature of the relationship she felt she had with the OT. And I'm just gonna read that briefly. The fact that the OT seemed as interested sharing strawberries as ensuring the house was safe meant we could relax and not feel like a chore. It made such a difference then and afterwards, being seen as people first. She even used to walk around with me at, at the hospice. Being someone with whom I'd built a rapport, she would often be the person breaking the impossible news about progress towards active dying. As well as the relationship that we have with our patients and our families, we must maintain our relationship with our communities. We must be prepared to be the grit in the oyster uh, that, that, that uh, is prepared to work against uh, the mainstream. There is something about innovation. There is an important piece of work where we continue to hold the tension between practice and education and research, as Cicely Saunders uh, really saw the potential for in those early days. And I think perhaps most importantly, we must continue to recruit, recruit and retain a workforce that, uh, that, that works on, on uh, vocation. That's the only way that will retain the compassionate nature of the care that so many of those people uh, from People in Partnership described. Importantly, uh, whilst retaining some of what we've done so well in the past, we must change too. We must move from being service providers to change agents. Our effort must be around transforming end-of-life care. And we must work with the system. We must work with our communities. We must work with people who really can see the potential for change at grassroots. 
and we could be part of a new public movement towards better end-of-life care that draws in communities and local people as well as professionals. We've got some fantastic skills to enable to do that. We know how to listen and to engage with people at end of life. We've got fantastic practice that we can model. We need to be training and inspiring people, finding new connections inside the system and with our communities. We must attend to inequalities. We must look for the people that fail to access our services currently. We must experiment, as Tracy described, and we must campaign for something different. Jake Garber, who uh, has been talking to Sean and myself, uh, is interested to set up a new community of imagination to take forward in particular the uh, new uh, public movement. I've got some uh, cards uh, where he is inviting you to join that uh, community if you'd like to, so please do uh, come and talk to me afterwards. Our position of strength must be more than professional expertise. We uh, often uh, rely on that, and we have something terrific to offer in that. But most importantly, we have a really unique position to sit uh, between the communities that we serve and the health and social care system in which we have uh, a significant uh, position. Uh, Dan Farag, who you have a chance to hear later today uh, from Nesta, describes the fact that he thinks there are two important questions around end of life for the future that we could hold uh, a, as a central player. What's important to the system and what's important to people and the communities? And he says that if we do that successfully, if we hold that tension and we create a space for genuine and radical transformation, uh, and if we can give to people uh, the opportunity for voice and for um, uh, interaction, then we stand uh, to, to make the real difference uh, that's required. I, when I was creating this slide, I tried to make that diamond in the middle something of a prism. Um, I didn't manage it, but it seemed to me that we've got the essential ingredients in there that would enable us to connect those two worlds and to find the opportunity to create uh, within it. We've got a strong history of innovation. We have the right people working in our workforce. And we have terrific leverage through volunteers and supporters and our history to mobilize communities. The other thing about our uh, desired future state is that we'll focus on conversations and relationships, uh, not buildings. And we must be working in, a com in, in an environment in, that, is death, that, that is death confident. We need to be working in communities that know how to converse and how to engage professionals uh, and the public together. It isn't uh, any more about buildings. It is about allowing families and communities to have central stage. Sean. And to pick up. Uh, Dan Farag's um, examples, really, of, of two, two sort of strands. The next phase will, um, is our opportunity to explore the, the, two, the two influences that we think can help us form a framework in which we can all plan for the future. And the first is the, the changing system of care for people at end of life. And the other, as we've talked about, as Heather's talked about, are the key uh, societal changes um, that, um, that are actually um, happening, particularly in, in relation to older people and end of life. And if we think about um, a continuum, this long line, and um, we call one end, this, this, this far, far end on your left, the system cares. So this is where there is a full system, the NHS at its best, holding and cradling people and providing all the care that we need. It might be health and social care, and it's a whole system. And the far end of the system is, um, uh, far end of the continuum rather, is no system at all. And what I've got underneath there are, are four points that sort of characterise um, th th those, those areas. So we've got about shared vision. We've got a national policy. We've got investment in, in services and workforce. And we have overall accountability. 
And of course, at the far end, we have fragmentation um, and, um, and diminished provision. We have um, the fact that it's actually available to very, very few people. It's harder to access. Um, and some of those elements would only be available if you were to pay. And if we think of this continuum as an, uh, as an X axis of a, of a graph, then let's think about what the Y axis might be. And this would be looking at key societal shifts. And at the bottom, uh, rather neatly, we've, um, we've probably inappropriately used a, a, a Sicily quote here. It, um, you matter because you're you. It's about you, it's the we, it's society, it's the collective you. Um, it's about um, a sense of shared ownership and shared involvement. And at the top of that particular continuum, you've got, it's all about me. Um, and health, and again, you've got some examples of, 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 of how we would characterize those two, those two polar or opposites on this particular continuum. So health is the responsibility of the individual. I can't rely on, on the state or anybody else. I'll work at home because I choose to and because it gives me greater um, control. And of course, at the bottom, you've got participation, organization, involvement, engagement. Okay? So those are the two, the two sort of um, axes that we hypothesize. And then, of course, you'd put them together in a, to make a little matrix, a two-by-two two matrix, because, of course, uh, no new theory is worth its salt unless you can put it into a two-by-two two matrix. <laughs> and here we have it. And um, we've, again, tried to characterize uh, what it might look like to be in each of those quadrants. So if we were to start at the bottom, where there is a full system, um, and where it's about the, co the collective you, we, us, um, we've got tradition, we've got doctor knows best is how we've characterized it. There is a system. Um, there is reliance on, on, um, on um, the system holding you. And we'll go into each of these in some detail, but just to kind of briefly uh, introduce each of them. The top is, uh, is around I matter, but it's also within a system. So it would be some kind of limited menu of choice. And we've called that personalization because there is control. I, as an individual, would make some decisions based on what I believe I want, but I do it within a system, albeit a limited one. If we then move to the top uh, right qu quadrant, your right, uh, privatization. Again, it's about control if, uh, and about um, autonomy. It's about, in this instance now, on the far, far, far left, sorry, far, your far, far right, it gets terribly confusing, um, within, within no system. So this is probably the quadrant in which we see greatest differential. Um, people who have money, uh, who will be able to pay for private care and for, for the services that they want and they need and they determine are important to their lives will have them. And those who don't probably will, f will, uh, will have very little choice in that. We'll probably see much more variation in that because there will be no system to support them. And then we move to the, to the bottom right qu quadrant, which is around community action. This is all about you. It's all about we. It's about us but we're doing it within, within uh, the context of no system or a very fragmented system. So we'll see lots more grassroots involvement, lots more grassroots endeavors to make things better at a, in achievable ways. Let's talk about each of these four in, in, in a little more detail. And we've got a sort of a characterization here from a, a number of different TV shows, which hopefully help make them a little bit more memorable for us. Now, this is that bottom left quadrant, Doctor Knows Best. And um, we thought that uh, the, uh, the TV, TV show Doc Martin probably summarizes this best. What might being in that bottom quadrant look like? And who, who would it, who would it um, how would it benefit its, its beneficiaries? Well, there would, of course, be a tremendous sense of reassurance and a, and, and a sense of being held by the people who sit there. The players would probably be quite traditional. Um, they'd probably be traditional referrers. They'd be health and social care professionals. Probably the, the, um, the workforce would be largely clinical, the settings would be in a hospital or in a care home, and the conversations that people would be having who, who occupied that, that uh, bottom left quadrant would be, um, you're safe now, don't worry anymore, we've got what we need to look after you. And the business model probably would be block contracts. Okay, I'm going to have to whiz through these fairly swiftly. 
The next is um, about personalization, and we've used the television program uh, that's uh, hosted by Gok Wan, How to Look Good Naked, because it's all about the individual. And, um, sorry, that's just gone off there. Um, we, this is about um, the beneficiaries here are, are in control at all times. It's all about um, having choice, and it's all about feeling enabled. The players are a blend of public and voluntary sector and commercial providers. The workforce is very varied. Um, it'll, it's perhaps more likely to be about brokers and advisors, less, less likely to be solely clinical. Um, there'll be all sorts of different players, much greater diversity. Um, there would be some, some options within uh, personalization, and, um, and, and there would be some choice. And, and um, the conversations would be, may I have, or I can help you with. We call that the managed market. Privatization, uh, some, something of a cliche here talking about The Apprentice, but the panel um, of entrepreneurs, it's all about everything you want if you have the money to buy it or nothing at all. The players are primarily commercial. They might be insurance companies. Uh, they could be, um, if you fall out of that and you don't have the money to pay, it might be old fashioned charity. The place would be anywhere you want or nowhere at all. The conversations would be, I expect, or will no one help me? And it's all about profit in that, in that quadrant. And the final one is about community action. And here we have DIY SOS, that SWAT team that, that catapult themselves into people's lives, often people who have fallen through the net, who are living in real adversity. And through the, the the individual actions of many, many people, their lives are transformed. And their, their difficulty is recognized, and they, they end up in a better place. This is about involvement. It's about, um, it's about ownership. It's about engagement. Again, it's multiple players, mixed agendas, and very varied inputs. We would say that the workforce probably there would in, in, embrace volunteers, professionals, activists, and informal carers. It's very much rooted in, 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 in grassroots. And the conversations that would, people would have in that, that area would be, we could, and together we will. It's about shared risk and shared benefit. So those um, actually characterize those, those four quadrants, and we'll come back to those in a little bit. But perhaps I can move on now to proposition three. And that is um, our belief that hospices absolutely need to engage in radical and extended change to get uh, to the desired future state. And this is about us, really. Um, we don't believe we're any exception to that, and we have started that journey. We, Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. We have to make that paradigm shift. Um, and, of course, many of you will be familiar with the work of Charles Handy um, and the importance of starting that second curve. I won't go into it here today because, again, I think many of you know it. But it is so important to, to take stock before you reach maturity, before you have everything um, established, and understand and anticipate the, the future needs and start again. So we need to move. This is St. Christopher's uh, coordinates plotted on this map. And you'll see that um, we believe at the moment we're probably fairly heavily still in our roots, in our bottom left-hand quadrant. Because we believe in a system, it, despite the system struggling, uh, despite um, the struggle for NHS uh, funding, despite the ever-increasing demand on services, we are still invested in a system. Um, and we also believe that um, there is, there is a, a reason for us to be part of a, a, a uh, part of a, a number of wider players. We have set foot into personalization. Um, a number of our rehab services are, are all about um, self-determination and fixed, um, uh, fixed time services. Um, in privatization, we have a, a personal care service that is uh, designed to generate profit. Um, and of course, we have a number of different community action um, endeavors, but they've mostly been I think it's fair to say peripheral. We believe in their importance, but we certainly haven't shifted money away from core clinical services to community-based um, act action. So we believe, as an organization, we need to move from that to this. And you will each, as organizations, find your own way and your own uh, 
the relative merits of being in different positions in each of these quadrants. But we do believe we need to invest more in community action. It's the, it's the best way to en engage and enable the community who are already supporting us, either through volunteering or, th or through giving. Um, but many people also want to do more. Of course, we'll want to keep a foot in, in Doctors Knows Best. That, you know, that is the baby that we must hang on to. It is our expertise, it's our clinical knowledge, and um, it will become ever more important as in complexity increases and people's, people's needs are harder to meet elsewhere. Personalization will have to keep up with, will have to grow, because that's the way society's going. More and more people expect to determine what they're going to have, when they're going to have it, how they're going to have it, and they're going to tell you how they've, how they've experienced it. We have to move into that, whether we like it or not. And we will also need to earn new uh, money and find new earned income streams. So, of course, we will keep a place in personalization. This is... Um, some examples, and I'll just go through them rather, rather swiftly, but a, a sense of how we are uh, repositioning ourselves for this reinvention. We are, um, we are renegotiating with the NHS. We are coming to the end of a five-year contract. When asked if we could, we were prepared to roll it over six weeks ago, um, whilst, the, um, whilst the NHS locally reorganises itself, we said no. Uh, because it cannot be the same anymore. Um, five years ago, that, that, that funding represented 45% um, of the costs of providing those care services, and now it represents 39%. We're going in the wrong direction, and it has to change. Um, we are having explicit conversations in the organisation about the importance of change, about having a model for change, so that it isn't just something that people feel is happening to them, but they understand the theory, they can, they can have have conversations about where they might be in a change cycle, and we all understand that we're on that journey together. We're also involved in adapting services in a number of different ways, and here is a mention of, uh, of a publication that came out earlier this year about age-attuned hospice care. We're developing all sorts of new services around heart failure, um, supporting a, a wider um, population and, 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 and more generalist needs. Um, we have... Um, a set of responsibilities, uh, really, to en en encourage and engage people who, who want to stay in control of their own lives and want to take personal responsibility for their health, um, their death and their dying, and, and how um, people are going to view them afterwards. We're engaging in personal markets. I've talked about St. Christopher's personal care already. We're moving away from buildings in the sense that um, we actually closed a ward uh, two and a half years ago. We had to because we weren't able to recruit the nurses that we needed to staff it. But through the, the changing practice of the clinical team, we've managed to see as many patients in the year following that closure in, in three wards as we saw in the year before. So we've increased our efficiency. And the, the statistics here, which are far too small for you to see, but you can, you can enlarge um, if you look at this online afterwards, is you'll see how much uh, our, our community services have increased in that time. And that's clearly where we need to put the resource. Community action is all about all sorts of different ende endeavours. We have creating conversations in Croydon. We have compassionate neighbours. We have coach for care. They're all about new ways to engage what is a very willing public um, to get behind the work that hospices are trying to do in new ways. Um, we have a new approach to risk. In fact, we took a new approach to risk to our board only last month, which is actually ab about embracing um, the new world in which we engage and... Um, and making ourselves a little bit more fleet of foot. We're on the last two slides. So just to finish then, uh, in case you're feeling weary and think, well, this is all just too much, I, I can't do it, um, I want to just suggest to you that you uh, reflect a little on Dame Cicely Saunders and her own journey. Uh, the biography that's most recent, written by David Clark, came out in June this year, launched on her 100th birthday. It's a cracking read. Sean and I, uh, neither of us had the opportunity to meet uh, Dame Cicely, but I've learned so much about her in this book and been really uh, encouraged, uh, not least because she was struggling with so many of the issues that we are all struggling today. It's easy to think that in 1967 it was more straightforward, but she had just the same worries about funding, about workforce, um, about uh, her relationship with the NHS. 
And she really encompassed uh, those characteristics of leadership that are in the triangle. When Gordon Brown wrote about courageous people, he wrote of Sicily and others as having altruistic courage, sacrifice and determination for a higher purpose, the courage that endures and prevails and eventually dignifies all humanity. She had huge empathy, she listened hard to people, and she was constantly connecting people's suffering, concerns and aspirations with her own vision, and by golly, she was resilient. At the heart of her whole, um, her whole uh, energy was this strong vision of a different society. And we uh, must continue to have that uh, if we're going to make the changes that are required. Sean and I wanted to give the last word to Ian Leach. Uh, he is uh, somebody that we spoke to from People in Partnership. His first encounter with the hospice movement was uh, through his own daughter's illness and death. He's been an activist. He now works uh, for the hospice in Litchfield doing uh, community engagement, and he's a fundraiser. And when I asked him the same provocative question that Sean asked me, uh, is hospice dead? Should it have any place in the future? He said, absolutely. Hospices are how it should be. We need to keep sharing the magic so that anyone can get it, whoever cares for them, wherever they are. Thank you very much. Thank you.